Dr. Gleb. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Ashley. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, let's talk about defeating unconscious bias. So the structure of the presentation, just to give you a foreshadowing of what we'll be doing, is we'll be starting with a number of examples of specific ways that we fall into unconscious bias, dangerous judgment errors, and what happens. We'll talk about that. So the first part of the presentation will be about these dangerous judgment errors that contribute to unconscious bias. And unconscious bias, by the way, when we talk about unconscious bias, what we mean generally is making bad judgments about other people. So that's why I talk about dangerous judgment errors. When you have unconscious bias, you unconsciously, without being aware of it, make bad evaluations, problematic evaluations, untrustworthy evaluations of other people. And of course, that's really problematic for managing projects in an effective way. Whether you make bad judgments about other people or they make bad judgments about you or they make bad judgments about each other. Because projects don't just manage themselves. They require people as the key stakeholders for managing them as you very well know. So that's why you really wanna make sure that you make good decisions about people and that others on your project management team make good decisions about people rather than bad ones. And to do that, you need to address unconscious bias. So I'll talk about those problems, the specific ways our minds go wrong as informed by neuroscience in terms of unconscious bias, judging other people. And then the second half of the presentation will be about ways of addressing them. First, understanding these unconscious bias, examples of unconscious bias, and then how to defeat them. So that's the structure of the presentation. All right. So let's talk a little bit about these dangerous judgment errors. And first of all, let's talk about judgment itself, decision-making itself. You've probably been told and you probably feel somewhat confident in your decisions. You want to be confident in your decisions. You want to be decisive. You've been told and you may well engage in activities like trusting your gut, following your intuition, trusting your heart, being confident about how you feel. In very many areas of life, not project management, in everyday life. So let's talk a little bit about everyday life first before going to professional activities, just to give an example of how we make judgments in everyday life. And I want to ask you first, do you consider yourself an above average driver or below average driver? Are you in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? So let's talk a little bit about decision-making there. And what you'll see right now in front of you is a poll that you will be able to answer using Zoom polling. So please vote whether you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers. Please go ahead and vote using the Zoom polling. Go ahead. So I see about two thirds of the people voted. Great, let's give the rest of the people five more seconds to make your voice heard. Pretty quickly can evaluate whether you're in the top half of all drivers or bottom half, a couple more seconds. All right, so let's see whether, you know, how many people in this PMI chapter are in the top half of drivers or in the bottom half. So you'll see, interestingly enough, 85% of you are in the top half of drivers and only 15% of you are in the bottom half of drivers, right? <laughs> this is a pretty typical result. Of course, when you look at the population as a whole, you'll see that Everyone's either, you know, you'll have 50-50 in the top half all drivers and the bottom half all drivers. But we tend to be confident about ourselves. We tend to be confident of, about our judgment, about our driving skills, about the decision-making we make in driving. And we don't realize that we tend to be too confident. We tend to be too confident in our judgment in our driving, and we tend to be too confident in our judgment about people and too confident in our judgment about projects, all sorts of things. You, know, you might have a lifetime of experience driving and other people have a lifetime of experience driving too, or not a lifetime, you know, a few years, however long you have experience driving. And we feel that experience causes us to be in the top half of drivers. Whereas, you know, realistically speaking, we are not as good on average, as you can see, with 85% of the people believing they're in the top half fault drivers, only 15% of the people believing they're in the bottom half, that's an unrealistic number. So that's something to be aware of. And that's one example of an expression of an unconscious bias. 
This one is called the overconfidence bias. Overconfidence bias is a specific dangerous judgment at our cognitive bias. We'll talk about that a little bit later, what they are. It describes our tendency to be way too confident in all sorts of decisions. Our decisions about people, our decisions about projects, about tasks, about plans, about driving, all sorts of things. You know. How well can we squeeze into the little gap in traffic, right? There is research, specific studies showing that when people say they're 100% confident, you know, they bet the farm, they bet their career, they bet the company, they are right only about 80% of the time. 80% of the time? No wonder Las Vegas makes so much money, right? People are way too confident for their own good. 100% confident, you know, it's, it's pretty bad that they're only right 80% of the time. This is especially dangerous for people with more experience and authority. So people with more experience, more authority, more expertise tend to be more confident than they should be. For example, there was a study of doctors comparing junior doctors and senior doctors. Junior doctors meaning ones who are recently freshly out of medical school and senior doctors ones who have been working in the field for a long time. And they were making an evaluation of case study and making a decision on certain treatment for a patient. Well, when you saw the treatments and the junior doctors and the senior doctors, the junior doctors and the senior doctors made their evaluations correctly of the case study of what the appropriate situation is and what the appropriate treatment is at about the same rate. But the senior doctors were way more confident in the quality of their decisions, even though the quality of their decisions was just about as good as junior doctors. And you'd think, well, why? I mean, the senior doctors have more experience. Well, the junior doctors are have more recently gone through med school and they have more fresh knowledge, whereas senior doctors may not be have the most up-to-date knowledge. So that's an example of where more seniority, more expertise, more authority can cause more problems when, in terms of overconfidence bias. Now, this relates to a broader tendency that we have of going with our gut. We've been told to go with our gut. Gurus like Tony Robbins and Malcolm Gladwell tell us to go with our gut, trust our heart, follow our intuition, and things like this, or comparable things. You know, Tony Robbins says us to be primal, be savage. And Malcolm Gladwell tells us to make your decision in the blink of an eye in his blink. blink. That's great for making money for them because what they tell you in terms of their decision-making, be primal and blink is comfortable to us. It's intuitive to us. It tells us what we feel is good. Our gut is very comfortable with such decision-making going with our gut, right? Trusting our intuition, following our heart. But it often leads to disasters, pretty disastrous decisions when we make evaluations about people, about projects, about driving and so on. Our gut, unfortunately, our heart, whatever you call it, our emotions, they're not evolved for the modern environment. That's not what they're evolved for. They're evolved for the ancient savanna. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, and we were hunters, gatherers, and foragers, that's what we make good intuitive judgments about, similar situations that are similar to that environment. But we don't make good gut judgments about situations that are different from that environment. In that environment, for, in the tribal environment, we had to be very oriented toward people who are part of our tribe, who look like us, who shared our values, our appearance, our cultural background. It was very important that we were like them and that we liked them. That was very important because if we weren't sufficiently tribal, if we didn't have that sufficient tribal loyalty, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. And you notice we're the, ancestors, we're the descendants of those who didn't die. Similarly, we have to be very hostile to people who don't look like us, who don't share values, people from other tribes, because if we weren't sufficiently hostile toward them, they'd conquer a tribe and we'd still die. <laughs> so that's not great either. So that's why in that tribal environment, it was a good, in that environment, in the Savannah environment, it was a good idea for us to be tribal, but it's not a good idea in the modern environment. And that's why we have to be wary of going with our gut when evaluating other people and when evaluating other sorts of decisions. But we're focusing here on unconscious bias, so that's evaluating other people. And here you need to be, understand that we have a series of dangerous judgment errors, a series of what 
cognitive neuroscientists, behavioral economists like myself call cognitive biases. That's the formal term. That's a formal scientific term. So if you want to look it up, you know, Google, Google cognitive biases, you'll see a list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia. There's going to be over 100 of them. You can check that out. Uh, you'll get more resources here for the ones that are specifically relevant to you. And these cognitive biases, they come from a combination of our evolutionary background, like I said, so the evolutionary background, as well as simply the structure of our brain, the way our brain processes information. The amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, you might have heard those terms. I can talk about that in the q and I'm not going to go in depth into the neuroscience and the brain structure of it here. So I want to talk a little bit about an experience many of you might have had. And that has to do with how we make decisions and how we realize when we make bad decisions. Did you ever have the ha following happen to you? And again, look at the poll. You can answer it in the poll. You made a bad decision. And you're looking back, you realize you had the information needed to make a better decision. I know it happened to me. I remember when I promoted in my team, I run a company called Disaster Avoidance Experts. It's a consulting, it's a future-proofing consultancy. And I promoted one of my staff to assistant manager. And for I thought she would do really well, but she really didn't. She was she was she was pretty bad. She micromanaged people, she couldn't let go of her previous role. And looking back, I realized that there were certain signs that she was not going to be a good promotion when I made the promotion, but I kind of ignored those signs. And I fell into overconfidence about her being a good person to promote. So let's see, we have about two thirds of you voting. I'll give you five more seconds for those who didn't vote yet. Please go ahead if you vote on whether that happened to you or not. All right, so we see that overwhelmingly that happened to literally everyone. So that's a very, very strong tendency that happens to us. And that is dangerous, an example of a dangerous judgment error. For me, I shared the overconfidence bias. There are many, many other related cognitive biases that could have happened to you that caused you to make a bad decision. But that is the problem with these cognitive biases, that they cause you to make bad decisions, even though you really should have the information to make a better decision, or you may not even look for this information to make a better decision. So that's a problem. Let's talk a little bit about something that many of you might have wondered when I started speaking. Where are you from? Not when I just came on, not when you immediately saw me, I looked like a mainstream, normal white American male, but I obviously have an accent, right? So it's clear from when I start speaking that I'm not from around here in the US. So where are you from is a question I often get asked and I'll be happy to share. It's a small country in Eastern Europe called Moldova. It's so small, it's a small landlocked country. It's so small that it needs an arrow to point to it to write the name, so tiny country. My parents came from there in 1991 when I was 10. So they brought me over and I was really glad that they came, especially in 1996 when I read about a world values survey that was taken and that world value survey showed that of all the countries surveyed, Moldova was the least happy country in the world. The least happy country in the world. I don't know why. It's, you know, I was 10 when I left, but that made me especially glad when I left. My parents settled in New York City. So that's where I grew up. That's home for me. And then in New York City, it's a cultural melting pot, very diverse place. So different from North Alabama in that regard. Of the, the amount of diversity in New York City. So you have all sorts of different accents around you. And I didn't feel the need to get rid of my accent. You know, many immigrants chose to drop their accents, especially when they came to places like North Alabama or where I'm here, where I'm right now, Columbus, Ohio. But in New York City, it didn't feel like it was something important. So I chose to keep my accent. My parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So that was great. But Unfortunately, as I later learned when pursuing my doctoral degree, my PhD, that was kind of a dumb decision on my part because of a phenomenon called accent discrimination. Accent discrimination. It's a perception that those with foreign accents are less trustworthy 
than people who don't, who have American accents. That's the perception. That's an unfortunate perception, but it's the perception. It's a consequence of tribalism, of course, where people with a foreign accent are perceived to not be part of the American tribe. There's only one foreign accent to which this doesn't apply. And that's the British accent. They still have that cultural imperialism going for them. But generally to accents like mine and others, it does apply. And that accent discrimination is a subcomponent of two cognitive biases, two specific cognitive biases called the halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. The specifically accent discrimination belongs to the horns effect. It refers to people having little horns. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, so one characteristic of someone, if you dislike one characteristic that indicates that they're not part of your tribe, whether because they have an accent, whether because they have a different appearance than you, whether it, there's a gender, they, they have, you're uncomfortable with their gender identity, whether it's a religion issue, whether it's a politics issue, different religion, different politics, whatever it is, the things that are significant to you, that feel important. Maybe they didn't go, they went to a college that you don't like. <laughs> That's a rival of your college. So if you just like one characteristic, one characteristic of them, then you'll have two negative view of their other characteristics. And the same thing for if you like one characteristic of them. That's called the halo effect. If it's someone has a little halo on their head, if you like one characteristic, you'll tend to have two positive view of their other characteristics because it will feel like they are members of your tribe. So it's especially dangerous for business relationships, for things like hiring and promotion. It's a real problem, hiring and promotion. And also that's kind of external for, to the organization and also internal within the, the organization, it's working on teams. So when you're a project manager and you're working on a team with other people, that is a, can be a big problem, the halo effect and the horns effect because of these business relationships. It tends to come out also in, within different divisions in the same organization. So for example, you'll see conflicts between sales and operations all the time, or you know, between legal and pretty much everyone else. <laughs> So the, the, these will tend to be the kind of tensions that you'll see within organizations where people from different departments feel like they're part of a different team. And this happens on things that even that don't really seem to matter before actual performance, not simply legally protected categories, religion, politics, whatever, appearance, but things like which college you went to and which team you root for. So here I'm in Columbus, Ohio. If you know anything about Columbus, it's the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. It's the big team here, college football team, big fans here. It's really, really popular. And our big rivals is the University of Michigan Wolverines. The University of Michigan Wolverines. We've been beating them for every year for about a decade. We didn't get the chance to beat them this year because unfortunately their team got COVID. But anyway, so that was, uh, that's the big rival here, rivalry here. And I was giving a presentation, much like th this one, conscious bias, to specifically a team of, not a team, but to at a closing conference of this local HR group, the Hraco, which is the local HR group for Central Ohio. And so imagine there are over 100 professionals in diversity and inclusion in the audience. So they're giving that presentation to them. And they're, of course, coming from this region, from local. And I'm giving this presentation. And I ask them as part of the presentation, how many of you would hire a Michigan fan? So how many of you would hire a University of Michigan fan? So I have this recorded. And I will be glad to share the screen. So you'll be able to see this. Uh, let's see. You should be able to hear the sound right now. So I'll be playing it. So this is the presentation. This is a video of me doing that presentation. So check it out. I think it speaks well for itself. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Oh, there you go. 
Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. So three people, three people indicated out of over 100 that they would hire a University of Michigan fan. Three people. And I gave them a chance to change their mind. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> In which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> so you can see how something that clearly doesn't seem to matter for actual performance in the workplace makes a big, big difference for whether HR leaders who are specifically at the Diversity Inclusion Conference, who are interested in this topic, obviously, whether they would hire someone who goes to a university whose team they root against. So let's see what's up with a similarly situation uh, with you. Do you think that, oh, hold on for a second. So I'm curious whether that's a problem for you. So you can put it in the chat. I'd be curious to learn uh, in the chat whether you feel that that's a problem in your organization or not. And you can share what kind of a problem it is, what, what's an example of that problem that you've seen in your organization. All right. Let's go on to the next one. So I want to talk a little bit about another cognitive bias pair that we don't often tend to think about when we think about unconscious bias, when we think about things having to do with discrimination. And this has to do with cognitive diversity, the way we think differently, not only the way that we act differently or appear differently or root for different teams. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias. The optimism bias and the pessimism bias are two important cognitive biases. So the optimism bias is, has to do with people who are really optimistic and see the world as full of opportunities, not full of threats. It's very opportunity-oriented people, people who are entrepreneurial, people who are creative, but who tend to have the problem of being too risk-blind. That's definitely the case for me. So I tend to be way too optimistic about the world compared to how it actually is. You know, people who are f creators, founders of companies, so I mentioned I founded the company Disaster Avoidance Expert, tend to be very entrepreneurial, creative, opportunity oriented, and at risk blind. I mean, uh, I was going into, into it with my eyes open. I know about half of all startups fail within the first five years and three quarters fail within the first 15. And so I took steps to address that because of my expertise. Most people don't, unfortunately, which is they tend to end up in the 75% of those percentages that fail. So that's the optimism bias. And the pessimism bias is the opposite. It's people who are focusing on managing threats. They see the world as more of a hostile place and they want to focus on managing threats. They focus on stabilizing situations. They focus on improving things but they tend to be too risk averse. So that's kind of their crime trust. Now, when you think about teams and collaborations, you'll, if you tend to be the person who is more pessimistic, you'll tend to see optimists as just, you know, giving half-baked ideas and shooting from the hip. So I'm the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and I have 20 ideas before breakfast and I think that all, they're all brilliant. <laughs> and that is the, how you would identify someone who's optimistic. Now, if you're optimistic and you deal with pessimistic people, you'll tend to see them as the Mrs. No or Mr. No, who are really reject everything, oppose everything, seem hostile, seem critical. That's the perception from both sides. And that's not great because it's really important that you work together. The research shows that in order to manage a project effectively, make good decisions on it, you need at least two on your team of 
or both optimistic and pessimistic because the optimists are great at generating ideas. So I have 20 ideas, like I said before breakfast, and I think they're all brilliant. But if we had all optimists on a team of six people, then we'd have 120 ideas before breakfast and we'd be reinforcing each other and saying, these are all great ideas. And we'd be running in 120 different directions and we'd get nothing done. That's not great. So it's very important to have pessimists on the team as well. Pessimists, you know, I make sure, I click very well with optimists. I like working with optimists. I like bringing optimists on my team. And it, it's very tempting for me to just bring in other optimists. That's the halo effect, right? I have a horns effect toward pessimists. But because I know about this, I make sure to bring on my team, hire into my company, some people who are pessimists. And I give them these 20 brilliant ideas I have before breakfast. And they say, well, these are all half baked potatoes, but these three may be worth finishing baking. And they look at these ideas, they fix all the flaws and they implement them very well. So the pessimists tend to be very good at implementing ideas. And so that's their strength. They tend to be very good at evaluating ideas and implementing them. So that's why when you do brainstorming, traditional brainstorming does not work very well at all. You do not want to have pessimists in the initial stage of brainstorming. It's just unnecessary stress and emotional labor for them. You want to have optimists brainstorm ideas and then give them over, hand over ownership completely to pessimists and then have pessimists evaluate the, the ideas and implement them effectively. So that's kind of a, an example of a much better way to collaborate. So let's do a poll on this topic. Do you think it would be valuable for your team to investigate and address any negative impacts from the optimism bias or the pessimism bias in your organization? So please go ahead and vote. Do you think that that would be a valuable thing for you to do? See about half of you voted, please. The rest of you, please go ahead and vote as well. I'll give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. All right, great. So we see that, that for the vast majority of you, 89%, you believe it would be valuable. So you, that means that you've seen situations where the optimism bias or the pessimism bias has been having a negative impact in your organization, insufficiently positive, whatever, however you want to frame it. And then you, you think it will be valuable for you to address it. Great. Let's go on to talk about how can you address these dangerous judgment errors? How can you overcome them? What are, what are the key techniques and methods for doing so? First, you need to learn to go against your intuitions. It's pretty uncomfortable to do that, going against your intuitions, because they feel right. Our intuitions feel correct. That's the definition of our intuitions. They feel right. But they are not great for the modern environment. They're great for that early savannah environment, that early humans, your ancestors. They evolved in us and we still have them because they help those uh, humans survive and we are the, the descendants of people who are very tribal. But our brains are not great at all for making decisions in the modern world. And you know that not only from unconscious bias and from my presentation, but from other areas where you have had to learn to go against your intuitions, learn to go against your gut reactions. For example, in food. Now imagine that you're in the break room before the pandemic and somebody, you know, grateful vendor sends over a box of donuts, right? It's a big box of donuts, 12 donuts. And then you're walking in the break room and it's pretty tempting to take a donut, you know, half a donut. So you decide, okay, I'm going to take half a donut. Well, then there's that half a donut and you don't want to leave half a donut for somebody else. So you take the other half. And then you're kind of triggered by the sugar and you take another donut and then another donut. And before you know it, half the box is gone. Not that it ever happened to me, right? <laughs> so that is a specific dynamic that comes from the savannah environment. I mean, obviously it's not healthy to have half a box of donuts, but that's something that we tend to be triggered by sugar, whether it's donuts, whether you're triggered by ice cream, whether you're triggered by chocolate, whatever it is. That all comes from that savannah environment because in that savannah environment it was very important for us to be triggered by sugar, by honey, by apples, bananas, to have as much of it as we could stuff that helps us survive and thrive and reproduce. 
but it's bad in the modern environment because of the overabundance of processed food that triggers us. Of course, it's been processed specifically to trigger us because it's what causes us to eat more of it and buy more of it. You've probably developed some ways of protecting yourself against it. So for example, instead of going for those processed donuts, you may go for a healthy bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor has sent over and is also in the break room. So you pass by those donuts or whatever other habits you've picked up to manage your diet. Now, it's still, of course, very difficult. We have the obesity epidemic here in the United States because of that sort of, of that instinct, that trigger triggering instinct. But you've probably come up with some ways of managing that for yourself, hopefully. And you need to do the same thing in order to ensure that you have good physical fitness. That's, you know, do manage your diet, you exercise well, all of those things. Similarly, you need to go against your intuitions not simply in eating, but in your judgments about other people in order to have good mental fitness, in order to have good mental fitness, mental hygiene, in order to make good decisions around other people and other aspects as well. And to do that, you need to develop your emotional intelligence and social intelligence, your emotional intelligence and social intelligence. So emotional intelligence and social intelligence are two critical tools that you need in order to address unconscious bias in yourself and in others. Emotional intelligence has to do with yourself, it has to do with awareness, being able to see and being able to manage your emotions, your intuitions, your gut reactions, your heart, whatever phraseology resonates with you. So being able to manage that in those internal experiences where they tell you one thing about other people, but you need to understand that what your gut tells you and what the reality is maybe two completely different things. So, and you need to redirect your gut in the right direction. So that's awareness and management. Similarly, social intelligence has to do with awareness and management as well. You need to be aware and you need to be able to influence other people, their emotions and their relationships with each other. As a project manager, you're managing other people in the team and your collaborations with them. Or if it's not a formal team, then it's your relationships with a number of stakeholders you need to manage. You need to understand what kind of biases they tend to fall into, and you need to be able to manage their feelings, their emotions, because we're creatures who are fundamentally ruled by emotions. We're told to go with our gut, trust our heart, follow our intuitions, and we tend to do that until we learn to readjust our emotions, our intuitions to be more effective. So not the simple baseline tribalism that we are born with and that we tend to go with if we don't learn how to have more effective mental habits, to have more effective mental fitness. So you need to develop your emotional intelligence to avoid making unconscious bias, to avoid falling into unconscious bias in your judgment about other people. And you need to develop your social intelligence to influence other people, not to fall into unconscious bias and make bad judgments about other people. Now, thinking about this emotional intelligence and social intelligence, I want to ask you, and again, another poll, do you think it would be valuable for you and your team or other stakeholders with whom you collaborate to develop further your emotional intelligence and your social intelligence? Would that be valuable for you? Please go ahead. All right, give you five more seconds to vote if you haven't yet. Great. So we see that overwhelmingly everyone believes, 100% of you believe that it will be valuable for you to develop your emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Great, excellent. So this presentation, of course, will help you do that. And I'll send you some resources after the fact, after the presentation to help you do so as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how you can uh, develop your emotional and social intelligence and avoid making these dangerous judgment errors. Well, what you need to do is first learn about them and assess them, evaluate them, identify them. And there's a tool to enable you to do so called the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace. I told you there's over a hundred cognitive biases, but not all of them are relevant to the workplace. The assessment on dangerous judgment er errors in the workplace focuses on the 30 that are most harmful, most damaging, most dangerous in professional settings. 
it helps you evaluate their extent, which ones are present and their impact, how impactful they are in your workplace and provides you with the next steps for addressing them. I'll give you a take a glance at this assessment and so you could see what it's about. We will not go in depth into it. We will not go into the next steps. Just know that I'll let you take a look at the questions. So we'll take a look at the questions, the assessment part. And the second part of the assessment, which you'll get yourself, allows you to actually evaluate their impact and take the next steps. So I want you to bring up the chat. You should all see the chat. You should all see the assessment right now and we'll be using the chat feature for this. So the assessment talks about the first the directions. So each of the questions below, there are 30 questions in the assessment, refers to a problem. It doesn't say halo effect, horns effect, confidence bias, overconfidence bias, opt optimism bias. It just refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. So specific behaviors that anyone without any knowledge of cognitive biases can identify. The answer for each question will be in terms of percentages out of all the possible times that the problem might have occurred. And you can focus your assessment on a specific unit, on a department, on a group, or on an organization as a whole. Each question should take you 10, 15, 20 seconds. Just go with your initial impression of the situation. So let's start with question six. When a potential or current employee was evaluated, in what percentage of the situations was the evaluation too positive due to factors not relevant to their job competency or organizational fit? So please answer in the chat. Number six, please go ahead and put your percentage for your organization or your unit or your team, whatever, you're, whatever you would like to evaluate, whatever you're more familiar with. Please go ahead, check your answer. So we see 70%, 33%, 25%, 60%. 40%, 70%, I think Robert, oh, 50%, yes. 40%, 60%, 50%. So when you think about this answer, the another 50%, if it's within the 10 to 20% range, it's okay, you know, it happens. It's not too bad. When you're getting into the 20 to 30% range, it's becoming more of a moderate problem. When it's 30% and above, it's becoming a serious problem. It's something you really want to do something about because, of course, you're making unfair and appropriate evaluations of other people, not you necessarily, but the organization is making, or whoever is making the evaluation is making inappropriate evaluations. And then you're not having appropriate promotion, you're not having appropriate bonuses. So it hurts merit, hurts retention, hurts all sorts of things within team morale. Not great. Now, let's do another one that you should be familiar with as a project manager. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in the last year? So go ahead. What percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in the last year in your organization or team? 10%, 80%, 10%. Ten percent. Go ahead. Ten percent. Sixty percent. Forty percent. Twenty percent. Twenty-five percent. Eighty percent. And so, good. And so you could see again, it's the same logic. If it's you know ten to twenty percent, not too bad. It's okay. If it's twenty to thirty percent, it's a moderate problem. More than thirty percent becomes a serious problem because, of course, you're misallocating resources and making bad judgments about resource management. And the first one, of course, this one has to do with the halo effect. This one has to do with another cognitive bias that we didn't go over of yet, that we didn't go over, and it's something that you'll get additional resources to use to learn about it, called the planning fallacy, the planning fallacy. This has to do with our overconfidence about plans. We tend to feel that making a plan means the plan will come true. You know, failing to plan is planning to fail. You've probably heard that phrase. Unfortunately, that phrase is quite misleading because it implies that making a plan will result in coming true. Whereas in reality, the appropriate phrase to use would be failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. 
failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. We have a lot of things that can go wrong and we tend to underestimate them because of our overconfidence about our plans. So this is a big problem, of course. And of course, there are 28 more questions. And then the second part of the assessment will have the identification of the cognitive biases and next steps for addressing them. All right. Now, you've taken a look at the assessment. I want to ask you via the poll, do you think it will be valuable for you and your team to take the assessment on dangerous judgment errors and address the cognitive biases and it uncovers? Would that be valuable for you and your team? Please go ahead and vote. Let's see about three quarters of you voted. So I'll give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. All right. Great, so we see that the large majority of you think it will be valuable for you to take the assessment and address the dangerous judgment errors and covers. Great to hear it. I'm glad that you believe it will be overwhelming majority of you, 84% believe it will be valuable for you. Excellent. Let's talk about a technique that you can use as you identify these dangerous judgment errors, as you learn about them, or even without using the assessment. So you don't have to have the assessment to use this technique. I would advocate that you do both, I strongly advocate that you do both, but this technique can be used without the assessment. And this is a technique to get good enough decisions on other people when you're making evaluations of other people or all sorts of other decisions. Five questions to avoid decision disasters. So this is when you want to have a good enough decision. You don't need a perfect decision. You don't need to have, this is not for, you know, you want to maximize how well a project will do. So you need to make the best decision about a major issue. This is for good enough decisions. The kind of things that we make, you know, five to 10 decisions a day, you know, how do you write an email effectively to an important client or an important stakeholder? Who do you involve in a meeting? All the sorts of little things that you decide, you know, on the deciding on a vendor of a non critical component for your project, whatever you're deciding, so many things that you as a project manager have to decide daily. Five to 10 times a day, you can use this technique to avoid decision disasters, make good enough decisions on questions that you don't want to screw up, but you don't need the perfect answer. First, you want to think about what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? It's very tempting for us to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. That's called the confirmation bias. So that's the first part of this question. What important evidence didn't you consider? So look at that information twice as hard that goes against your intuitions. And the second part is important information. You don't want to fall into analysis paralysis. So you want to look for important information, but you don't want to look for too much information. So decide what information is important for each question. Of course, the bigger the question, the more resources it is, the more information you might want to consider. Second, what dangerous judgment errors didn't I yet address? We talked about the assessment on dangerous judgment errors, so that might be a very useful tool for you to use in this situation. Once you go through it, you'll learn about dangerous judgment errors and ones that you really want to address for each particular decision. What would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in this situation? Think about maybe a peer member of your project management uh, chapter, what would they suggest you do in this situation? Think about a trusted coach, a consultant, a mentor of some sort. You get about 50% of the benefit by stepping outside of yourself and evaluating the situation. And you get the other 50% of the benefit if you want, if it's a significant enough question just by calling this person. So easy to do that, right? Next, as you're implementing, thinking about the implementation, think about all the ways this could fail, all the ways this decision could fail. Think about it, reflect on it, and address these problems in advance. So you want to address these problems in advance of them occurring. Finally, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? As you make the decision and implement it, think about metrics you would use to evaluate whether this decision is going well or not. You can set a specific timeline for reevaluation. You know, reevaluate it in 
two weeks, or you could set a specific number for reevaluation. You know, reevaluate once we hit a certain project deadline or a certain number of orders shipped or something like that. So that would cause you to revisit the decision. Or let's say if you're writing that important email, if your key stakeholder doesn't respond within several days, you can say, okay, I'll, then I'll give them a call or something like that. So that's the way that you would use the five questions to avoid decision disasters in order to address unconscious bias in your decisions about other people, or of course, other sorts of decisions. Now, let's go again to the poll. Do you think it would be valuable for you and your team to use the five questions to avoid decision disasters technique to avoid making bad decisions, just make good enough decisions? So please go ahead and vote. I see about 50% of you voted. Let's get the rest of the people voting. Give you five more seconds. All right, great. So we see that this proved even more popular than the assessment. So over 90% of you, the vast majority would want to use these techniques. Great, I'll, I'll send you a decision aid after the presentation with these five questions that you can use and distribute to yours yourself and distribute to other members of your team. And talking about these resources, let's get to the resources that I promised. So three additional resources that you can get after this presentation would be the assessment and dangerous judgment errors in the workplace the decision aid on five key questions to avoid decision disasters, and sample, chap sample chapters from my best-selling book, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. And of course, this presentation, that's what it's based on, and a coaching session with me. There are free open slots, so first come, first serve. Whoever claims them first will get them, and you'll, I'll send you an email. You just respond to that email by, and schedule your slot. Okay. So similarly, we'll do the polling. Would you like to get the key post webinar additional free resources from the trainer? Please go ahead and vote. All right, and while folks are voting, I will look forward to taking any questions that you might have about the presentation. You can Type your questions into the chat or you can unmute yourself if you prefer that. Either way is fine. Let's see. So Ashley in the chat asks, if you're only able to form a team with optimism bias members, how would a project manager change their bias to keep the team on task? So what I would strongly orient toward is asking questions about how the project can fail and having specifically framed in this way. What you want to do is not simply say, you know, how do you think this can fail, but say, tell everyone, imagine that this project completely failed, or if you're looking at a specific decision within the project, specific of specific aspect of the timeline or other resources. So then that's where you want to uh, say, imagine this decision or this project or whatever you're doing completely failed, absolutely failed. Why do you think it failed? And that will appeal specifically to optimistically oriented people because it gets their creative juices flowing. It's uncomfortable for them to just say, oh, you know, it, it will fail because they will feel it will never fail. I'm great. I make good decisions and it will never fail. So you want to tell them it definitely failed. Absolutely failed. No question. Then why did it fail? Let's brainstorm about that. So get them into the brainstorming mode and get them to be creative about reasons that might fail and then look, help them address it. So that's the way to really work with that if you only have optimistic team members on your team. So Robert asked, making quick decisions. Uh, that's the five questions technique. The five questions technique is perfect for making quick decisions because it only takes a couple of minutes to go through. So let me backtrack to these five questions. 
you know, going through these questions, once you learn about them, once they become a habit, only takes you a couple of minutes to go through. This was actually similar to a structure for questions that was taught to firefighters in the UK. So there was a study on firefighters in the UK who were taught a series of three questions about firefighting. Now, if you look at firefighting, about 80% of the errors in firefighting come from human error, come from bad decisions that firefighting leaders make. So they were taught a series of questions that were more relevant to firefighters to ask before they send their team members into the heat of the moment, into the flames, literally. And as a result of being taught this technique and practicing it for a couple of months, once they got habitually into a mental process of asking these five questions, they made their decisions just as quickly as firefighters who weren't taught to ask these free, the, those questions but they made their decisions much better. So great reduction in the amount of human error. So this is something that you can make use to make quick decisions. It's very easy. It takes you only a couple of minutes if your decision is right. And of course, if your decision is wrong, then you want to take a little bit more time to think about it. Brian asks with the horns and halos effect, most people have characteristics perceived as negatives or positives. Does the first impression drive whether the horns or halos have, oh, absolutely, first impression causes us to be anchored. Anchoring bias is another bias that's talked about in the assessment that we didn't go through. So anchoring, we, in, we use our first impression of other people to make our judgments about them. And that impression of other people is a very powerful thing that filters the rest of our judgments. So that is definitely a powerful aspect of what's going on with the horns effect or the halo effect. You're welcome, Ashley. So Austin asks if the best approach to avoiding unconscious bias is being aware or mindful of it, what's the best approach to take when only a portion of a team or organization is willing to acknowledge or address unconscious bias? How do you get the whole group to buy in? Well, that's one of the things that I recommend. That's one of the reasons I recommend using the assessment because it doesn't talk about the unconscious bias as a thing. It talks about here are specific behaviors. What, is there ever a time you know, within the last year, how many people were to judged too positively within this organization is one of the questions that you all took. How many people were judged too negatively based on factors that weren't relevant to organizational fit or so on? I will guarantee to you, Austin, that you'll have plenty of people who are unwilling to acknowledge an unconscious bias as a thing, as unconscious bias, will tell, will say, oh yeah, lots of people were evaluated too positively, or oh yeah, lots of people were evaluated too negatively, including me. <laughs> and that will get the conversation going. So you don't want to use this term, but you want to use the assessment and you want to focus on behaviors that many people will acknowledge. And then from that, you go on to, well, okay, so there were lots of people who were judged unfairly positively. What caused that judgment? What caused that evaluation? And then you dig into it. And that's where you go into revealing the causes of unconscious bias. And you show to these people who are not willing to acknowledge unconscious bias that it's definitely present and it harms them. It's bad for them because of these unfair assessments. And that helps other people be more into distressing it. Let's see. Great, I'm glad you're gonna give it a try, Robert. And let's see if there's any other questions. You're welcome, Austin. Glad that that was helpful. Any other questions? And I think Michael has to go. Okay, Michael, no worries. All right, it seems that there are no further questions and you'll see the information on the PDUs that Ashley gave in the chat. So just use that, copy paste it, and then that will give you information on the next steps. I hope you've found it helpful and I will send you the information after the presentation. All right, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Club. And on behalf of PMI NAC, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, this fantastic presentation. I think our viewers really enjoyed it.
And uh, we look forward to seeing your uh, work and hopefully a couple more books coming out. Hmm. Excellent. All right, everyone. So I'm gonna close off the meeting. So make sure that you copied off the, copied the information on the PDUs. You're welcome, Karen, and you're welcome, Margaret. Brian, you're welcome as well. Hope this has been helpful and have a great day, everyone. You're welcome, Thank Diane. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Ashley. Welcome, Stan and Charles, glad it's helpful.